All right. So let's see. We got Gabriel and Thomas. Today is one of those days where Brooke has to do it by himself because Dave is a good man. He's going to take some. Well, I'm just going to give you the story. So we sent out some small kits, and uh-oh, we didn't send the hot ends. So he's running some hot ends to get there with the packages that are shipping, that shipped out. So uh, we won't have our beloved Dave here. I'm solo, which means this is going to be a little slower pace. But here we are. So if you guys, uh, this is a little bit of the pre-show at 416. And if you want to ask questions, I can answer. Or we can just stand here looking at each other. And then I'll get bored and I'll say something about one of these things on the table. But it uh, should be a fairly short show today, maybe half hour. Okay. I think I'm just going to try to stay right here. Everything's within my reach. Oh, you heard it? Okay, great. Okay, have a good mail run. How are the modified designs of the Adoptabot going? We are doing, when are you doing the build video? I was going to do it today and didn't. So I have a little bit of an update on that, but I'll just tell you. I've already got uh, version 1. Point, am I on 1.1 or 1.2? I don't want to screw up my screen there, so I don't want to look. But yes, the, the main, I'll get to this a little later, but the main thing I've been working on, and I think I finished it today, just got to do some testing is I really wanted this extruder to be 3D printed. So I know I'm po pointing at a simple. It's because I had this one at my house. And we've had a couple of versions of, of uh, extruders. Here on the, I don't know how fancy I'm going to get with all of this video stuff. Let's see if I can, maybe that'll work. Is it going to zoom? Oh, it did zoom. Okay, so this is a little stubby nose here, and this is the Alu V1. Well, when we did this one, it was back on the simple. I don't think I have one with that on it. But that first extruder, um, man, I used to do laser cut wood, like the Wades. I did all kinds of crazy stuff, bad ideas. But, I mean, they worked. But when you're making thousands of printers or hundreds, uh, you want something that's really, really robust. So we did this design in aluminum, machined aluminum. And it worked really, really great. Until people were like, wait, what about NinjaFlex? And it didn't work that great on NinjaFlex. So that was a whole different target. So we ended up, uh, do, so by the way, if you have an Alu V1, NinjaFlex is really not going to work. But then we went on to another one with a whole different style arm. You can see how slender that is. And that one was a very, very similar base, still had a pinch for the UBIS hot end, you know, just uh, using the screws off of the motor. But this guy was uh, a little better designed because all the tolerances were tight. And it really got close. Uh, it got, we used a smaller, yeah, we used a smaller um, roller bearing. And we were able to get in a little tighter and we brought the base, uh, we bought the, I don't, I don't know how to point, but we, we brought this little nose up into this little peak that came up into the drive gear. And for a while, we even had this little uh, fitting. Uh, what was it? It was a, like a little custom uh, channel that actually reached up to make sure you weren't going to draw filament through and it get all tangled up. If you've had one of these extruders, try NinjaFlex. It'll do that. It'll go, if you're printing too fast, it'll start to kick out the side, and then you'll get this spaghetti out the front. Well, we had to really redesign the base and the arm at the same time to do that. So this was called the Alu V2. So, but the problem is, these are expensive. I mean, these are made locally here, uh, machine parts. There's the arm, the base, and then this little Delrin pin, and we've recently changed to aluminum. Um, just for a little tighter tolerances on the tightness of it. People were tightening this either too little or too much. And if it's too little, it'll wobble. So anyway, but uh, it's a great extruder design. So before we do these, we actually print in plastic. And so I took a look at the plastic uh, prints, the versions of these that we had. 
because I really want this Adoptabot to be as printable as possible. I don't want there to be anything that ties you to Printerbot necessarily. If you choose that, then fine. Um, I'll back up here. But that extruder has been kind of a mind block for me. Uh, so I do have a list of other changes to make on this, and just be patient with me. I don't want to do the build video until I get this design done. So it's this week. I only have Friday left tomorrow uh, with Dave's help. So I'll see what I can do uh, tomorrow morning or tonight and see if I can get that build video going tomorrow. But the other thing is um, when you change hardware, you know, it changes your bomb and it changes the bag of nuts and bolts and stuff. So I'm in process on V. 1.1, or it might have been 1.2, I forget, but anyway. So, uh, that's coming. Um, I know I say this every week. It's coming! I'm going to do a video tomorrow! And it, then I don't. But I am, I'm hanging in there. Let's see, what else we got? Hey, what's up, Nick? You want a replacement Delrin piece for the Alu 2? Um, yeah, you're going to have to fill out a ticket, probably. Uh, if you want that in Delrin. Of course, you could print one. Um, I don't know. You can have this one. That's the Alu V2. Uh, this one's a chewed up a little bit, but we have, we have some of these left. Uh, we, what I say, some of these Delrin versus the aluminum. I think we still have some Delrin. Should be able to get you one. Just uh, contact us through support. Um, was it for an Adoptabot? This is uh, Jeffrey was asking. Let's see. Where can a person get a simple t-shirt uh, like Dave had? Hey, the fact that my, I guess that's just a screenshot in Facebook. I hope I'm still live. Is the video working? Somebody tell me if the video is working. 423. Okay, it's working good. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. I'll stick with the metal one on my adopted bot. Feel it will be better compared to a printed one since mine was shipped with one. Are the updated files online yet? Ugh, sorry, guys. No. I have. I, I guess I should look. Am I still on camera? Okay. I can be over here and not have a blank screen. Let me see real quick. <coughs> You know what I should do? I should share this half done. <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to share a link with you that I'm working on the extruder if you want to grab the files. Come on. There. But I warn you, I have not even... Where did it go? Oh. There's the V1.1. All you're going to see is the plastic extruder. That's the only difference, really. I might have done some cleanup work on uh, some other parts on that model. I can tell you. Let me look. Yeah. I've done some cleanup work on here. Some, some stuff was bugging me on this part, so I cleaned those up. Um, I've added a few screws to the front, but I still have to fix a couple of issues. And one actually is uh, this back case. I've just finally decided, yeah, we're going to split this back case further back so we got screws here. And I'll figure out a way, either with a simple screw, most likely, we'll tie these two panels together so it's a little more, more firm. I've got to tell you that a guy online, let me see if I can find it. Um, Ay, ay, ay. I'm looking on my Twitter feed. I don't know if you guys follow me on Twitter. It's just at Printerbot. Um, he did a really nice uh, case for ramps. So he converted his adopt the Adoptabot design to ramps and put a case on it. He really feels that teachers are going to want. There we go. I don't know if you can see this. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in here. Golly, too many things to do. Ah, oh, 
it's all backwards. Gosh, that sucks. This guy designed an extruder. Oh. <laughs> he designed a, a printed extruder. And he has, let's see if there's a shot. He even did a case on the back with a switch. And you see that slick side that he has? Uh, he put a case around the wiring and all that for a ramps board and then added a fan and a switch on the back. So it's starting to happen. Uh, people are starting to do uh, their own designs for Adoptabot mixing it up. And several people, oh, he's also done some, this is Gareth. I wonder if he's in the chat room. Anyway, his name's Gareth. Uh, Bobblejot, at Bobblejot on twin Twitter. B-O-B-B-L-E-J-O-T. He does some really nice designs. Uh, he had some cable ties that he added. Not a big deal. Uh, in fact, it's a good idea. But I remember thinking, man, why am I not just using some of these talented people's designs? <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to keep stay the course. Um, that link is if you want to try the, the extruder. I haven't even tried the base. I actually split this up into three parts so it would print a little more nicely without a whole bunch of overhang. I'm being very sensitive or, or uh, support. All of these parts can be printed without support. So do not print with support. If you're printing with support, you're doing it wrong. And you're probably not orienting the part correctly. The plates that I uh, developed um, or threw together uh, will put them in the right orientation. By the way, that one missing file, I forgot this top handle. That's fixed. It's in the files now on adoptabot.org. So anyway, all right, any more questions? I'll go on now. Uh, any reason why the Simple Pro 2016 is on super sale on Amazon? Really? They don't even tell me. Amazon is an interesting company. They, they buy things from me, and if you read the fine print, they're like, it reads like this. Basically, we can screw you. So there's that. And if we don't like anything, you have to take all the printers back, and we get our money back. They're very difficult. Um, so I'm not a big fan of selling through Amazon as a business owner. I'm a big fan of Amazon Prime, I'll tell you that, as a customer. But no, I don't know why they're doing that. <clears throat> they're probably trying to get rid of them. But you know, if it's a good deal, buy it. Um, ours, we did lower the price on ours to $6.99, and I bet that pissed them off. They have bots that go out and check to see what price you're selling it at so that they can always beat your price. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, let me go on now. Um, let's see. Small Zelly arrives tonight. Awesome. I helped work on that. Uh, that Smalls you're getting, Robert. The first few things, uh, the base, the bars here, that was all done by me. That was fun. Anyway, um, Margie Drum joined. That's my wife. All right. So let me tell you the other Adoptabot. So I have been struggling. Um, you know, the Adoptabot, it is a big, it is a lot of moving parts, so it's difficult. But let me just brush through this very quickly. So I've got all these people that are willing to help, and some of the groups are, you know, raring to go and, and doing things like the extruder group. They've really done a lot. Um, but some of the other groups need direction, and I take full blame for that. I need to give them clear direction. So I uh, can't do a lot until the files are completely finished. There's a build video. There's an updated bomb. You can see all my notes on the bomb. Uh, but we've got to get this right. But I'm going to take you through um, one thing that I've decided. So here it is. I went through, and I got all my wiring together, and I've been going through every day the last few days. How can we utilize this wiring? So let me say this first. There's this group of work that will upcycle things that I have available for free right now. And then there's everything after that. So I thought, well, I don't want to create a big complicated machine to just you know, rework a few wires like I was talking about last week. Um, because there's a lot of specialized tools involved. And that doesn't scale. Uh, we can't find enough broken things to make the throughput of the sales of these printers, you know, to, to get them in the hands of people quickly. 
So there is going to have to be a half measure at the beginning of this uh, next part of the campaign, which is going to be 100. The goal is 100 printers by Christmas. So um, the file should be done very soon. The build video will be done very soon. I'll have all the nuts and bolts, correct sizing in the drawing, and then we can do exploded views, and the instructional video can match that perfectly. And all the recent parts can be in the pictures so people aren't confused. One problem with open source hardware instructions is, you know, there's people already posting videos of them putting it together, which is fantastic. But the authoritative instructional video needs to come from Adoptabot and me, and I'm the one that needs to say, these are the official files. Here's links to other files that would work with them, and there's a big community. But uh, you just have to know where the North Star is, you know, so everybody's, there's not a lot of confusion. So anyway, um, the wiring thing was really bugging me, and I had a kind of an aha moment. So here's what we're going to do. We are actually going to prepare the wiring kits up, unto, uh, up through the amount of rework that I can do. So I'm going to do the rework, and here's how that's possible. Instead of cutting all new wires, see, we had a lot of wires that uh, were the wrong length. So my wife and I have cut these down, and I had one half of a, a wire here. This is the hot end power wire. So there's half a wire here that I can use, and there's half a wire here that I can use. This goes to the, uh, the hot end. So what are we going to do? Well, here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to add to the requirements to build these things. You will have to solder. Now, going back uh, to 2011, I had to solder to build printers back in 2010, 2011. Um, that's all there was. And we got away from that because we wanted to be really consumer friendly. But I, was remind I just realized soldering is a pretty low bar. It's a very popular thing to do when you're at Maker Faire. OK, are we live again? Let's see. Okay, I think I'm back. Gosh. Okay, great. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, it never fails when I'm alone. It ain't a demo until it breaks. Well, anyway, what I was saying was um, here's where we're at with Adoptabot. Uh, the reason that I think I'm over the hurdle on the decisions that I needed to make to get to market quickly because. I'm going to require soldering with the kit. And that'll really make it a lot easier. Instead of sending crimping tools and teaching people how to crimp, and there's nuance involved in that, by the way, especially with hand tools. It was just really stressing me out to think, oh, I don't want to have to train people to do all of these things. And why should they if I can make wires here very, very easily, and uh, then we can source. If there's cheaper wires to be had, we can, we can source them. But, uh, what we're going to do is, like for the hot end power, we will send two lengths, and you will solder it yourself. We can send a little uh, heat shrink. For the thermistor power, or the, not the power, but the thermistor, um, two cables. You can cut it to length. Um, it's about the right length now. You can solder, and you're good to go. Now, the motor wires, uh, that was one that took me a while to decide. A very, very... Uh, specialized crimp here and a more standard crimp here. But you know what's easier is I'll crimp them and I'll get them to you. Now we may just house them for you as well because there is some nuance involved in that. I just hate for one wire to keep you from printing, you know what I mean? So doing these motor wires, which are very finicky uh, with the housing and even the crimping. So the end stops are easy. We have hundreds and hundreds of these little small ones that will be ready to use. But on these 12-inch ones, um, the wire's there and ready to roll. <laughs> I think it was like the one I picked. It has a weird crimp on it. But anyway, the, it's a simple solder to the two outside pins. So again, all you've needed so far is a soldering iron. Now this one's a little bit more finicky, but we get these... Uh, I wanted to explain this. I guess I better check. Okay. Hold on.
hold on, I'll get to your question in a second. Um, these are the, the sensors that we order, and they come with this long cable. Well, it's made in China, and let me tell you, they use uh, this wire isn't the best wire for wire fatigue. Now, there's, there's not going to be a lot of fatigue on the Adoptabot because it just doesn't move that far. And it's all pretty good uh, as far as the locations and the lack of, this, of strain on here. Um, not like, say, a plus with a really tight you know, bed sliding a long ways in a very tight space. But these, these come, and what we do is we cut them down, and then we strip them back, similar to this. Uh, these are way too long. But anyway, so you would cut this down to size, and then this wire is actually much higher quality wire. And so we have a lot of these, uh, we call them, um, what do we call these? The in induction sensor extension. So if you use this wire that we include, and the colors match, blue, black, and uh, brown, um, you can solder these together, you know, as short as or as long as you want. Solder those together, a little heat shrink, you'll be good to go. So it's a little extra work for each builder, um, but it saves so much time and money for me. And then eventually we can do a little better, but I'm not sure that I'll ever want to do this for the builders. Um, if they're building 3D printers, they're soldering. So, uh, you know, it's just a, a skill that a lot of people have. So I'm not going to fret too much. The kit's going to go out with, with soldering required. Um, this is the fan. Oh, I didn't bring a fan in, but you can imagine a fan with, uh, you know, on the end of the fan are two red, two wires, one red, one black. And it would just be a solder point for the fan. And you can decide on length clean up your wiring. Something that not a lot of people do, but I challenge you, do wire at least as good as I have here. And then we've got this little dongle, and we had those crazy parts somewhere last week uh, that this is scavenged off of. So we can just strip, crimp, house, and you won't have to worry about something that would take a very specialized tool. So basically it will get you up and running faster than me waiting on a whole bunch of people to do a whole bunch of intricate work for a limited amount of wires. So in the future, we could utilize people for housing uh, these wires, because that is very time consuming. But let me just go one step at a time. So anyway, now with the wiring uh, settled, uh, I can get the kit stuff out to the people. And here's one idea I do want to run past. You're still live? Here's one idea I, w I do want to run past people, see if anybody has an opinion. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, you know, this is a lot of stuff to ship around. And, you know, the easiest thing would be for me to do it all here, and it would be completely against the whole nature of the project. We want to use community members as much as possible, but not overload them. Uh, set them up for success. So if I ship, let's say I ship, you know, a couple big boxes of stuff, um, I'm thinking that I could ship to a distribution center in each, maybe one in each of the time zones. And so I can ship 25, a box of 25 of everything you need over there. They can kit it up. And as people contact, uh, as people in that time zone buy a printer or sign up to build or whatever, um, it would be a shorter path geographically for that kit to ship out. And so there would be people with a lot of parts. And as they get an order, they would kit it up and they would ship it out. It keeps it a little more simple. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm thinking right now. I just know that there's too many moving parts to have 50 people all doing one thing um, right now. But I still need people to do board work. Uh, I have a couple of volunteers I haven't contacted yet. Um, so board work is needed. And I need to find these distribution centers or at least use these uh, kitting people, the vitamin proof, as a centralized location, a centralized resource to get the kits tied up. So all logistics, kind of boring. But it's necessary. So anyway, uh, we're doing okay with the adoptive bot. It's just one of those things that it's a project. Um, it's not quite a product yet, but we're trying to get it there. Now, on the, I wanted to show you some of my fails on the extruder that I designed. Originally, how do you work this? Okay. What time is it? 4.43. We're going to be done in 15 minutes. So the, whoops, this right here is an example of the finished arm. 
and it's real chunky and blocky. Well, I started with this being my, you know, inspiration for what I was going to do. And of course, on the first one, um, my computer goes to sleep while I'm away from it. But it got, gave me an opportunity to see how bendy this was. It's just a little bit too bendy. It's PLA right now, which you might want to do it in a different plastic. But um, I thought, ah, that's not going to work. So I had a couple of failures because I couldn't figure out the dang setting on my Mac to stop it from going into screensaver. But anyways, then I decided, well, i got to beef this up a little bit. Let's make it a little thicker. So I made that a little thicker. And, but it required, I wanted it to print flat. This part originally uh, would print on its side, but it has this forked overhang that becomes problematic and you have to dig out. That's where the bearing goes. So I thought, oh, I want to print it like this so that it prints straight up and these forks are in the air and there's no real overhang uh, or support needed, I should say. So I started fiddling around with the angle of the print and I did this little slope. But with the top sloped, it skewed this through hole and it got a little bit confusing. On this, I had to print a couple of versions of this with different tolerances. This is on a .4, this is on this printer, a .4 nozzle. And it was just a little bit too uh, tight. Uh, in fact, this one, you can't see it, but I had to dig out the center with a knife and it was a pain in the butt. So I got it a little bit wider on the next version and that worked out a lot better. And so then I just gave up on that fancy design. I tend to do this, over design something. And so I went back to a very blocky design and this has even changed one other time. Uh, after this, and I've got a design that I think works really well, and it's very, 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 very strong. So and it prints flat, and you don't even need, on this printed part, you don't need this Delrin piece. Um, it just pushes up against the motor, and you don't need a washer on the outside. This has no washer. Here it is. Uh, there's no washer on that screw, so it just rests flat up against uh, the motor and all the, the clearance holes is all right. So just a lot of prints to get it to where I needed to go. But I, I was having so much fun with design this week, I wanted to show you one other thing. And then I'll try to take some questions. Uh, the, my son is on a baseball team and we live in Lincoln, California. It's Northern California. The weather's really nice, but uh, we had a little bit of a heat wave a few weeks back, and there we were sitting there in the stands, and I was just jealous of all these parents that had these sun umbrellas or sports umbrella or sports umbrella, these big old shade, you know, umbrellas. And I thought, get on Amazon, Amazon right now, Margie, and let's let's order one of these. So, one of the popular, uh, I got to go around. One of the popular. Let's see if I can just back up here. Okay. One of the popular add-ons for the umbrella thing is this clamp. It's just, you know, like a clamp you'd have on your desk. So it's like this, and it's, uh, it's got a little thing. You put your, the post of your umbrella in here, and you can cinch that down tight. It has this little sprung thing, so you can do different angles and whatnot. It's a beach umbrella holder, but you got to have something to clamp it to, so... I think they call this the bench buddy or something. So anyway, the U.S. patent. So, you know, the first part to clamp it to the, the uh, stands, you know, baseball stands that you're sitting in is a piece of cake. But then I didn't bring the whole umbrella in, which would have been hilarious. Um, so other people have ordered these and had the same, same realization, got to tighten that, that I did. Um, well, this would be great, um, but this hole is so big. It just falls through, and it rattles around in there. So they do have this set screw, little wing nut thing. But if you tighten this all the way down, I'll tighten it. Okay, that's bottomed out right there. Still doesn't work. So my uh, programmer actually has a kid on the baseball team too, and me and him both were like, oh, we can fix this with the 3D print. So anyway, I opened up Fusion 360, and I started designing. 
And it, it just took about an hour. And the first thing I did, I didn't have calipers, so I just used a, you know, a ruler. And I wanted to approximate the size of the hole here. You can't see it, but there's a little clearance issue here. The set screw sticks out into the cylinder a little bit. And so I just wanted to make sure I could get a tight fit. This rattled around a little bit, so I increased it a couple of millimeters. But that, you know, you can design something, let the first couple layers print, and then see how your clearance holes are. So this was a little bit tight. It fits over the plastic piece, but if you have to, you have to push it real hard. So that inner diameter was wrong. And if you do get it up here, I realized that there are these rivets on the side holding that plastic piece on. And that was going to complicate things. So what I ended up with is, let's see, this one. And I wanted to print the whole model. There it is. And you can see there's clearance for the umbrella to go in there, the rivets. That's a real, it's a pretty good fit. There's a little bit of slop in here, um, very little. But what's nice is you can kind of act, you know, this won't come out. Oh, whoops. Okay, if it's not aligned, that stops it from falling off. So that's nice. That fits on fine. And then this channel right here has a clearance hole for the set screw to go through. So and, and it sticks out a little bit. So I made that little channel going down through to give it clearance for that. So in the end, ugh, after, oh, by the way, I printed it full size on the uh, Simple Pro. So that's on the Simple Pro in low resolution, which is 0.2, and it's hollow. Uh, so you can, I don't, you can't see it, but it's bendy. But all I wanted to do was check it for size. So it doesn't quite reach the bottom. It's like three millimeters shy. But that clear hole, this is a super good fit. So then I printed one. This is 30% infill, and I just wanted to see if that would be enough, but you can hear it crackle a little bit when you pinch it really hard. So I ended up doing it in uh, dense or 70% infill. So now the set screw doesn't have to reach it pressing against the back of the cylinder. It reaches the umbrella hole itself. So anyway, I loved having a practical problem that I could solve with 3D printing. In a very short amount of time, I printed, uh, well, this four of them. Two are tests. This would work. It's just a little bit iffy for 30% infill. But I took the two 70% infills, and I gave them to um, one for, to my programmer and one to another baseball dad. And he was like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. It was really cool to see that, you know, something that cost me, what, not even a buck. Um, was just so appreciated, and it solves a problem for a lot of us parents because we're all ordering this thing. So it's, it's pretty fun. I just thought that was a neat story for a practical design project. All right. If there's any questions, ask them now because I'm about ready to cut it off. So we'll have a little question time. Whoa. All right. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? How about design it without the channel, the way you could put it on the pole without the top of the umbrella? That would keep it from getting lost. Oh, yeah, totally. You are, uh, no. It can't live on the umbrella. Um, let me get it. Maybe you're right. You could get it over the umbrella without these channels. You're right. I could omit these channels that uh, clear the rivets and slide it in from the top, and it could live on the umbrella. You're right about that, actually. You're right. I could load it from the top and then put that back in the umbrella and just stay there. Good, good, good call.
It would use a little more material, um, but it would live on there. I could tighten that up too, so it'd be a nice tight fit. I'd still have to have this clearance channel on the front. I love it. Like live design ideas. It's pretty cool. Don't you think a hot day the PLA will melt? Oh yeah. So it was like you know, turn this camera. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's like 70 degrees here now, um, but in a hot car, it sure might. So, yeah, I would recommend another plastic. I mean, I have all kinds of plastic, so you're right. When it gets to be hot summer, I'd want to print that in something else. I volunteer for East Coast. Yeah, I wonder what it's like over there, Kelly. Uh, while testing the Adoptabot, I built, I had some Z banding that I tried to fix, but still shows a bit, even though I minimized it a bit. Yes, so welcome to the world of RepRap. So I knew with a printed bot um, that it's, you know, I build, whoops, everything's falling. I build metal bots now and these problems go away, you know, for the most part. But uh, Z-banding, here's the issue. So you've got multiple uh, parts making up this base. You have a part that stretches across the Z motor and that's the, the flat part of it uh, mates to the motor, so it's perfectly perpendicular, uh, it, not perpendicular, it's parallel, you know, it's right on the top of the motor, so that keeps it nice and flat so that you do get that top surface perpendicular like this. But believe it or not, there's enough clearance in these M3 holes to slightly go off track with this axis that comes or is that the right word for it? Not axis. Um, it's the pivot point, the center of this uh, threaded rod. So wherever that threaded rod ends up, when you put it on the motor and tighten down this, that's the center. Um, another issue, too, is this, you know, you could tighten this in a way. Aluminum is actually pretty soft. Um, you could tighten this in a way uh, where it's catching a thread weirdly. Maybe you don't have it deep into the, the threaded rod, deep into the coupler. So I always look to make sure I'm splitting the space evenly between the motor shaft and the Acme rod. Now there's only one set screw on each of these sides. So anyway, there can be some little, little variances. And normally one little variance wouldn't result in a terrible Z-band. But they can stack up. So let's say you've got your motor in the wrong place, um, and you don't even know it's in the wrong place. It's just a little bit off. And then you've got uh, your Z-rod isn't down very deep, so it's, it's not perfectly centered all the way down, so it's standing right straight up where it needs to be. It could be leaning just a little bit. Um, these parts up here, so you're stacking two pieces together, and then a third is the Acme nut on the back sandwiched between a motor. So these things can, sometimes they just, it's the luck of the draw. Um, the surfaces not being completely flat uh, when you print, the bottom of a print is going to be flat. The top of a print is not going to be flat. And you don't have, all prints have a top and a bottom. So you can't mate a top with a top every time. So either the, so this uh, Acme nut is riding on the top, or actually the side of this part, and this part, uh, it's another side. So anyway, these things stack up, so you basically have to fish around to, to try to find out your problem, and you can make it better. Now, you'd never want to test it without this on top, because this will help, you know, this has a very finite, excuse me, very finite uh, center holes. So this, if your bars did happen to go in a little bit crooked, this will help them straighten out and kind of keep you know, everything in line. So yeah, uh, Z-banding could be a problem. I would start with making sure your uh, rod is straight, roll it on a granite countertop or something very, very flat. And if you can't see any really noticeable wobble, it's fine. Um, so it's not that. Make sure it's seated properly inside the Z-coupler and that the set screws are tight. Um, you can spin it on the shaft uh, with the motor sitting on the table and see that it's not doing this. Um, now, since it's not coupled at the top, it's just flying free here at the top. Theoretically, if you had a very rigid bot, um, 
if this was done in metal and you know all these parts were metal and I knew these were exactly where they needed to be, um, this could be a little bit wobbly but because these bars would keep it straight, but not necessarily in a plastic box. It's going to inherit a little bit of that wobble, so you do want it to run as true and straight as possible. So um, these, oh, I just pulled it out of its set screw. By the way, I put a flat on, oh, I, I can even see that I did it wrong. I put a little flat on my uh, rod here so that when I set screw this in, um, I can tighten it down and find that flat so it pushes uh, to the back and I'm not hitting a thread and it being caught between two threads, the set screw. So anyway, but when you put this together, all I can say is just try it, put it together and see. You can loosen these four bolts on the motor and see if it's a misaligned motor. Move the motor a little bit. And also when you put this Acme nut on, if it's skewed this way and you've got the Acme rod coming straight up, it's going to have some uh, pressure while it rolls on the Acme threads. Um, it's going to push at certain points against if, it's not, if the Acme nut is not perpendicular. So all that to say that I think a better idea would be, uh, and this was recommended by... Um, who was it? Oh, I forget. Anyway, uh, a guy that said, hey, let's do a printed Acme nut. The reason why that's really a good idea is I can first take a proprietary uh, piece. This, this is the old simple Acme nut. Throw that out. We don't need proprietary. Um, let's do something that is easier to deal with. And what that will allow you to do is I'll put a little uh, Acme nut that has screw holes down from the top and with some room for adjustment of that Acme rod. So if the motor ends up a little to the back, it's a little bit too far to the back, well, you could move the Acme screw a little bit to the back until you can just move it up and down and see that it's very true. Now, mine is very, it looks really good. I'm not thinking I'm going to have any Z-wobble. Um, also, make sure you take the time to dial your printer in uh, ahead of time. I have that little test piece in the model and that use that and what you'll do I know that the dimensions in the drawing are right so make sure your bot is calibrated now if you have a printer bot probably no reason to calibrate other than uh, make sure your belts are tight uh, make sure your set screws are tight you don't want mechanical slippage but the extruder possibly could use possibly could use uh, a uh, calibration and it's very easy to do um, what I do is I make, I measure up 100 millimeters on a piece of white filament, something you can see. I make a little magic marker at 100 millimeters. And then I heat it up and I say, go forward 100 millimeters. And if it stops right on the top where I measured, if it stops right there, I know my steps per millimeter are correct. But if it like dives down and it keeps going down and you're like, oh no, it's way off, you're going to get too much extrusion. If it stops too high, it only moves like 80 millimeters, um, then you're under extruding. But you want it to be dead on so that when you use a 1.0 extrusion multiplier in your slicer, which I know this is total geeks, Bill, but uh, you, you want it to be spitting out the right amount of plastic. So anyway, you might have to calibrate your extruder because different wear and tear on those gears, uh, different uh, style hot, um, extruders actually have slightly different drive ratios or like circumference or uh, diameter. I mean slightly. Uh, it's machining variance. Um, there was an old way of making these. The new ones are made on like a Swiss mill, you know, with very precise. But the old ones had some hand operations. So yeah, you might want to do that. And that way when you print your uh, test piece, you can take a bar. It's a very short print. You can take a bar, stick it into that hole. It should be hard to get in but not impossible. And you know, wow, that's a really good fit so that when you put this top cap on, you know, it's possible to get it off. You don't have to hammer it on. If you're hammering on this little bot, it's going to abuse it. You, it's okay to like knock it, tap, 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 but you wouldn't want to hit it with a hammer. Um, so anyway, you got to get your tolerances dialed in or you're just going to get bad results. Even the top layer, if it's over extruding, you'll end up with this on the top. You want a smooth top layer because these things matter. You need square and perpendicular and parallel. You need all that to work or the results will be bad. So I'm not trying to blame you. I'm just saying 
Maybe it's a tuning issue on your printer. Maybe it's a bad design uh, that I need to fix. Um, maybe it's when you assembled it, um, two things, three things added up, and it's got some wobble. Wow, that was a lot. All right. Uh, by the way, I had one guy um, go back to a method I used years ago. I don't have an old one out here. Well, maybe I do. Yeah, look at this. Years ago, uh, I'll zoom in. I took a piece of um, nylon tube and two zip ties, and that was my coupler. Um, so a little piece of nylon uh, tubing you can get at the hardware store. And a couple of zip ties, and, and that was my coupler. The nice thing about that was it's very, very forgiving. 